Hello, everybody. We're here for, sorry, I woke some of you up. <laughs> we have this great speaker system in here, which is really handy for those of you in the crowd. And um, we're speaking also to a Zoom audience, even though we can't see the Zoom information on here. I know people are out there. Um, welcome to both the Zoom audience and the, the audience in the room. We're happy to see everybody here. It's a beautiful May evening and um, nice of you to come in out of the lovely weather to join us for our last um, program meeting of the season. Uh, we'll start up again in the fall. I know Dennis will talk to you about that. Um, we um, have been enjoying having our programs here at the Campbell Center. It seems to work really well, parking and accessibility for folks. Um, we do kind of miss having our um, treats that we used to have at the, the Garden Club, but that's okay. We're all get, doing fine without it. Um, and I wanted to check, should we see if anybody has any bird sightings they'd like to share in the audience here? No birds? No. Connie. Finley, a dance between a golden eagle and a bald eagle. Oh, yeah. Harassing herons. That sounds pretty dramatic. <laughs> Very good, yeah. We did have a good um, bird walk last Saturday out at Fern Ridge Wildlife Area um, up the end of Royal Avenue. There were about 35 people that came out for that and the species list on that bird walk was 55, I think. Um, I know it was really good. They saw a lot of um, bitterns, was it bitterns? Oh, yeah, it was flying yes, bitterns. Yeah. right, bitterns were flying everywhere. So that was a big fun surprise for folks. Um, also, I just wanted to mention, we do have a donation box in the back. So if you feel so inclined, you can leave a little something in there to help us cover the rental of the room here. And um, we're excited to be here for tonight's program with Karina. We're looking forward to um, hearing about her puffin work. And Dennis will um, get us going, moving towards the program. So thanks everybody for being here. Uh, well, thank you for coming too. This has been great. Um, we do have some books back there too, if you would like to take a look at those and you can pay anything you want for them. Um, I normally would tell you all about next month's speaker, but since next month is June and we're not going to have a program and we're not going to have one until September, I actually do have three speakers lined up, but I don't have the dates yet, so I'm not going to give you any information about the fall. You'll just have to be surprised when you get the quail newsletter or look online. So tonight, tonight uh, we have a, a young woman that I um, met in January. I go to the um, Willamette Valley Bird Symposium at uh, Oregon State University uh, each January. And I watch these uh, young people, usually graduate students, give about a short 15 minute program about what they're doing, what kind of research they're doing. And I try to find some that would be great for us to have over here. And so that's how I met uh, tonight's speaker, Karina. Karina comes uh, from Hawaii. And she did her undergraduate work at uh, uh, Colorado State University. And she's now doing her uh, final work at um, Oregon State University, uh, studying a bird that I am just enthralled with. It's, it's a bird that, uh, you know, I would always go to the coast to see. I would go to have see the head with my telescope and I'd go find the, the birds at the see the head. And, of course, they're not there anymore. I used to then have to go up to Yaquina Head and find them there. They nested up there for a while. And so I've always been intrigued by them, wondering what's happening to them. And so when I um, saw Karina speak uh, in January, I said, well, we have to get her over here so we can learn a little bit more about this bird that's been uh, fun for all of us. So please give a nice warm welcome to Karina Kusaka. Hi. <laughs> Hope you're all doing well tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It's very lovely to be here. I'm excited to get to talk with all of you. Thank you, Dennis, for that lovely introduction. 
Um, like you mentioned, my name is Karina Kosaka. Um, I'm a master's student at Oregon State University in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Sciences, co-advised by Drs. Melanie Davis and Jim Peterson. Um, and today I'm just going to be presenting a little bit about my master's research that I've been working on for the past two years or so um, about a spatial analysis of trends in tufted puffin breeding habitat here on the Oregon coast. Um, so as Dennis mentioned, I was born and raised on Oahu, Hawaii, um, and then I came up to the mainland after high school to attend Colorado State University, where I got my degree in fish, wildlife, and conservation biology um, at CSU in Fort Collins. While I was there, I worked on a variety of different lizard and raptor species, a lot of them uh, threatened to the state. And I also worked as a waterfowl research technician and an environmental educator in Rocky Mountain National Park before starting my master's at Oregon State University in the fall of 2021. So just a little bit of background about seabirds and climate change. So as many of you probably know, uh, climate change can have direct and indirect impacts on seabirds through things like changes in precipitation, temperature, weather anomalies, uh, increased wind, frequency of storms, all of these things can potentially degrade their habitat and change their prey availability, ultimately affecting seabird populations long term. Um, and the tufted puffin is an iconic seabird here in Oregon in the family Alcidae. They provide a wide range of economic, ecologic, and culturally important services, such as bringing marine derived nutrients to terrestrial ecosystems. Um, providing ecotourism for local communities on the coast. Um, and they're also reportedly good indicators of ocean condition because they're quite sensitive to changes in prey availability and overfishing. Um, forage fish make up about 50% of their diet with the other 50% being small things like squids and crustaceans. Um, so here we can see the tufted puffin range in North America, let's see if this works. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, so here in North America, you can see they span throughout the California current system. So Oregon, uh, California, Washington, um, up into British Columbia and Alaska. And they're also found uh, throughout Russia and Japan. And so all the orange and kind of purple you can see is their breeding habitat on kind of these coastal islands. And then the blue um, is their at wintering at sea habitat where they go off to sea. And not a lot is known about their overwintering habitat. Um, I got this cool map from the Cornell Ornithology Lab. Uh, so just a little bit more background about their nesting ecology. Tufted puffins are colonial burrow nesters that commonly nest on offshore islands during the summer months. They, oh, whoa, they typically prefer a uh, deep soil and dense vegetation to be able to burrow under into that, um, that soil and build their burrow and they use vegetation for nesting materials. They also prefer um, to have cliffs with a pretty high slope so that they can have them take off and landing when they're flying. They're also very sensitive to human disturbance and typically flush if disturbed um, and exhibit high site fidelity. So they come back to the same islands year after year to the nest. Um, and then here I just have a quick little video um, from National Geographic. I thought they did a really lovely introduction in just showing um, how charismatic these species are. I thought instead of you know, pictures in my voice, it might be more fun for you to get to see them waddling around doing their thing. The currents filled with nutrients make the Bering Sea one of the richest in the world. In early June, thousands of caplin fish wash onto the shores, drawn by the instinct to mate. Within a week, most of the fish will be dead. More nourishment for the living. With the sea so full of fish, it's not surprising to find predators who specialize in catching them. Each summer, puffed-in puffins arrive on the islands off Kamchatka to nest. On Toporokov Island alone, 100,000 puffins catch millions of fish each month. 
Puffins lay a single egg that must be incubated for two months. While one parent cares for the egg, the other heads for the seed. Puffins are awkward flies and need cliffs to get air with. It's once they dive underwater that puffins truly fly and become master predators of the sea. In the world below the waves, the otherwise awkward puffins perform a graceful water ballet. All over the world. Okay. Um, yeah, so I thought that was just a nice little video to show kind of how charismatic they are both on land and in sea. Um, and that was in the Bering Sea. But switching back to Oregon, unfortunately, the tufted puffin population status in Oregon has declined really dramatically over the past couple of decades or so, with over 6,000 birds in 1979 to only 553 birds on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife 2021 survey. Um, and these declines are consistent throughout their range in the California current system, with them being listed as a species of greatest conservation need here in Oregon, an endangered species in Washington state, and a species of special concern in California. Um, and in 2014, the tufted puffin were actually petitioned to be protected under the Endangered Species Act. But unfortunately, in 2020, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided um, not to list them as a, feder a federally endangered uh, species. They stated that was because the Alaskan population, where a lot of um, their populations in North America were, were stable in Alaska. Um, but some recent research from Pearson, Scott Pearson et al. in 2022 showed that the Alaska populations aren't really as stable as what was once previously thought. Um, but regardless of the Alaska populations, um, it's pretty commonly accepted that throughout the California current system here, tufted puffin uh, populations have declined really severely. Um, so some potential causes of this population decline include reduced prey availability, insufficient breeding site conditions, ecosystem disturbance, uh, and factors related to climate change. Um, and there's still a lot of uncertainties about which key factors are driving population and habitat loss along the Oregon coast. Uh, so that leads us here to our research objectives for my master's project. Um, our first question, um, being to examine how habitat conditions at tufted puffin breeding sites have changed over the last 30 years or so that we've seen that population decline, um, and then relate those habitat changes to site-specific climatic and environmental variables to identify which key drivers are likely influencing that tufted puffin habitat. Uh, and we predicted that tufted puffin breeding habitat will have decreased over the past few decades, with more areas being vulnerable to erosion and vegetative degradation. Um, and we came up with this hypothesis largely from talking to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, National Wildlife Refuge biologist who has been surveying these islands for many, many years. And uh, he just told us anecdotally, he's like, when I go up there on my boat, you know, or survey it from the helicopter, I can see that the vegetation looks like it's decreasing, but no one has quantified this yet. And we don't have any um, information to scientifically prove it yet. Um, so that's kind of where the idea for this project came about. Um, so our study sites were within the Oregon Islands and Three Arch Rocks National Wildlife Refuges. 
So these refugees total almost 600 acres of islands and headlands across the Oregon coast. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is a map of the Oregon coast and all these red dots are islands or clusters of islands or headlands that are included um, in this refuge complex. And 47 of these islands were historically occupied by Tufted Puffin. So those 47 islands are the spatial scope of our study. Um, and here, just an example of what some of these islands might look like up close and in real life. Um, here we are on Hunter's Island in more southern Oregon. Um, some examples that some of you may know would be Haystack Rock at Cannon Beach, um, Three Arch Rocks National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and these islands are ecologically very important, not just to tuft and puffin, um, but they're also home to over 1.3 million nesting seabird species, um, of, or nesting seabirds of over 13 different species, um, and marine mammals such as stellar sea lion um, and harbor seals also use these islands as nesting and pupping habitat. Um, so just some other bird species that typically use these islands, um, the pigeon guillemot, uh, rhinoceros auklet, uh, the common mirror, and then also the leeches storm petrel. One of my friends at Oregon State University is also doing his master's project on the leeches storm petrel on these islands and trying to look at um, invasive mammalian influences on this bird and their nesting. So a little bit of a tangent, but um, I thought it was cool to highlight some of the other work that's going on here as well. Uh, so our first chapter is going to be focusing on assessing habitat change over the past three decades. Um, so like I mentioned, our main goal is to determine how this habitat in Oregon has changed over the last 30 years. And to do this, we're going to quantify vegetative loss or gain at tufted puffin breeding sites over time and use a supervised classification procedure to quantify each land cover type. Um, and so to do that, we're going to be using aerial photography because it provides a cost-effective, non-invasive, and detailed method to look at change over large spatial and temporal scales. Um, and in a lot of cases like mine, it can be a lot more advantageous than fieldwork, where a lot of our sites are inaccessible to get to. They're pretty dangerous to collect data on. Um, so aerial photography provides a lot more information than we could have gotten with traditional fieldwork methods. Uh, but we still want to make sure that what we're seeing in the photos line up with what we're seeing in real life. So we do some ground truthing on the islands that we can get to. Um, and this just entails sampling the vegetation on these islands in the field to improve the accuracy of our analyses. So here you can see us on some of the islands. Um, and I feel like this looks steep and climbing up it, it felt even steeper. <laughs> Um, so for this field study, we ground truth on these islands from mid-July to mid-August in 2022. So we really tried to time it so that um, the tufted puffins would have already fledged their nests so we wouldn't disturb them too much. Um, and we visited a subset of these islands. So out of those 47, we were able to get to seven of them safely accessible by boat. Um, and we did quadrat sampling at every five to 10 meter intervals, depending on island size. And we collected data on um, the percentage of different ground cover types, the presence or invasive, or presence or absence of invasive species of interest, height of tallest vegetation, elevation, slope, and GPS coordinates. And um, there we are collecting data on a pretty foggy morning. Um, and here we are again, this one, here was actually Hunter's Island in Southern Oregon. And this time of year, the grass was so tall. That's me um, in this little <laughs> grass hole. Um, and we actually had to wear these like crazy snowshoes when we were traversing the islands because those leeches storm petrels burrow under the ground. And if we were climbing on these islands, we didn't want to crush their, their burrows by stepping on them. So these snowshoes were really great in dispersing our weight. So if we stepped near their burrows, uh, we wouldn't be crushing them. But if I thought it was hard to climb on these islands before wearing these ridiculous snowshoes, <laughs> It probably took us like twice as long. So here you can see one of my field techs wearing them here. And then here again, she's got them on. Um, and this middle photo was in uh, Cheeks Island. Um, so if we were escorted here. You can see the Confederate tribes of the Kusler, Umpa, and Susa Indians. Um, 
And this was one of the few islands that we didn't vote to. We actually just waited for the lowest tide of the month. Um, and we all got up at like four in the morning and got dressed in our waders with flashlights um, and waited for the tide to be like the lowest out of all the times in the day and kind of scurried there, had an hour to collect our data before the sea, sea levels would rise and we wouldn't be able to get back out. Um, so that was Chiefs Island. That was really cool. Um, and here I feel like it doesn't really do it justice, but it felt really steep at the time climbing up on some of these rocks. Um, kind of like scrambling up this little path to get to like the vegetation all the way up here. Um, and as you can see, there's no like rock or no sandy shore to pull up on. So our really wonderful boat driver, Sean, kind of maneuvered the boat with the waves and would just try to get us to as close as possible to the islands. And we would scurry to like the front of the boat. And when he got close enough, we would just kind of like throw our bodies at the wet rocks <laughs> and hope that we stuck on. Um, and then getting the field equipment there was like a whole different hassle. So one person was on the boat and one person oh, was on the rocks. Um, and we would just have to get the boat as close as possible again and just throw all of our field supplies at them and kind of hope they catch it. Um, mm -hmm. And a few times it did end up in the ocean, but luckily we prepared for it and had dry bags and just kind of like fished it out of the ocean um, and tried again. But definitely some of the, the craziest field work I've ever done. <laughs> um, yeah, and then here, this uh, bottom image that was at Gull Rock off the coast of Newport. Um, that was really cool because we got to see some whale surfacing there. Um, but this was another island where this kind of like reefy area that we're walking on. Um, we only had about like 30 minutes to an hour before it was like entirely swallowed up by the tides. Um, so we had to move quick and it definitely smelled like seabirds on that one. <laughs> um, so kind of getting back more into looking at this aerial topography. Um, so our first step in assessing vegetation change over time was to retrieve NAFE and OSIP imagery. So uh, NAEP stands for National Agriculture Imagery Program, where they fly over all the states in the continental U.S. Um, and take photos um, every few years. And the resolution is usually pretty good. It's usually like half a meter to a meter. So um, as you can see, these two images are um, uh, images that I downloaded from NAEP of Goat Island. Um, and our second step was to pre-process this imagery to standardize it across years. So um, here we can see Go Island in 2009 and Go Island in 2020 after I kind of clipped them to the same boundary, georeferenced them, and then did some like radiometric normalization just to make sure the colors were comparable um, across different photos. And then our next step was to do a manual NDVI thresholding procedure to create two classes, vegetated and non-vegetated, which I'll go into a little bit more detail here. Uh, so we use this NDVI or Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is just a classification index calculated from the near infrared and the red bands of these photos. Um, a lot of scientists use this to determine the net abundance and distribution of vegetative cover, and it's widely, widely used to assess connection between vegetation dynamics and wildlife habitat. So essentially, the NDVI values range on a scale of negative one to positive one, and the closer it is to positive one, the more greenness it has. And the closer it is to negative one, the less greenness. So things like bare rock or water um, or bare ground would all kind of be closer to negative one. So in our thresholding procedure, we ask the computer to basically be like, at a certain threshold, anything above it, we're gonna call it vegetated. Anything below that number, we're gonna call it unvegetated. Um, so here we have the two islands or the same island in the two different years after creating these vegetation classes of vegetated and non-vegetated. Um, and finally, we subtracted these classified images across years to quantify change in vegetation. Um, so here you can see from 2009 to 2020, um, the NDVI changes on Goat Island. Um, so green represents vegetation gain, red represents vegetation loss, yellow represents vegetation that stayed consistent, 
and brown represents bare rock, that same consistent. So as you can see, quite a bit of that lush green live vegetation was last over this time period. Um, one caveat I will mention though, is that um, here it appears that a lot of vegetation was gained on um, the edges of this island, but having been to this island and kind of sampled and knowing what's there, I know that that's just kind of like slippery, slippery wet rocks and no vegetation has grown there. Um, so this method can have some errors in that like shadows on the island here, or sometimes the way the, the light reflects off the rocks, it can be mistaken for vegetation. Um, but here with the red, we it lines up well with what we see in real life and what the land managers have also told us. Um, so we did this for each year that we had available data. So on the x-axis, you can see um, 2009, 2011, and so on until 2020. And on the y-axis is the percent of ground cover vegetated. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of fluctuation from year to year, but the overall decrease in vegetation on Goat Island was about 15% over this time period. Um, we did it for another large breeding colony in Oregon, uh, Saddle Rock. And it varies from year to year, but again, um, the overall decrease in live vegetation was about 10%. And then we did this for Haystack Rock at Cannon Beach using the same methods, and the overall decrease in vegetation was about 9%. Um, so this figure looks a little bit crazy, but essentially we just did this for about 15 more rocks um, that are included in that Oregon Islands Refuge Complex. Um, some appear to have decrease in vegetation, some appear to have increase in vegetation, and some appear to have stayed the same. Um, and so, um, yeah, from these preliminary results, we can see that the broad scale vegetation changes on these islands. Um, some of the islands appear to have decreased over the past 11 years, but this is a relatively short time frame. Um, and as I explained earlier, this method can sometimes misclassify certain pixels to be vegetated when they're actually not. So we think that's what's explaining the vegetation growth on some islands. Um, so moving forward to improve our analyses, we are planning to use a long-term aerial imagery data set from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So every year that they had available funding from 1979 to 2021, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service flew a helicopter over all these islands on the Oregon coast um, and took pictures of these islands. The main purpose was to do bird counts, but since they have the photos, we're like, we might as well utilize it um, to look at habitat as well. And using this 40-year data set will just allow us to observe more long-term trends and more meaningful change. Um, so if some live vegetation um, did drop or some live vegetation died during the drier years, we can observe how long it would take uh, that vegetation to bounce back if it did. Um, we're also hoping to include over 40 islands across the Oregon range. So we'll be able to compare northern islands to southern islands and kind of see that temperature difference and how that affects the habitat, um, smaller islands to larger islands, um, and kind of break it up a lot of different ways to be able to compare habitats. Um, and then finally, we are doing a supervised classification procedure using uh, a random forest technique and including that ground truth data to improve the accuracy. So instead of just having two classes, vegetated and non-vegetated, which doesn't provide a lot of detail, um, we are able to break it up into senesced vegetation or dead vegetation, live vegetation, sand, rocks, shadow, um, water. So you can see we do that for goat island, and it provides a lot more detail about uh, what's going on by scale on these islands. Um, so here's just a quick example of after combing through these thousands and thousands of photos over the past 40 years, choosing um, some photos of Goat Island from 1997, 2013, and 2021 that are roughly comparable. Um, and then this was after undergoing the supervised classification procedure and breaking it up into those different land cover categories of loud veg, senesc veg, sand, shadow, and rock. Um, and then here we can kind of see what that might look like in terms of percent ground cover and how it would change over time with the available imagery that we have. Um, so as you can see over this 20 year period, similar to, 
to the results of like the 11 year period, vegetation decreased um, by about 17%. Um, and you can see that semester vegetation increased a lot or like the amount of dead vegetation um, and also sand. Um, and so we're planning to kind of standardize this data so that we can look at a very change detection matrix. So we're hoping to calculate the change area. So instead of just saying, you know, 17%, we can say, you know, X amount of acres or hectares or meters um, change. And we're also planning to look at the percent change and the annual rate of change. Um, and then in chapter two, after Quantifying that vegetative change, we're planning to look at um, drivers of that habitat change and kind of what is causing that. And here, I just want to take the time to watch another little video that I think highlights really well um, the importance of habitat for tufted puffins. And I think it's from the Georgia Aquarium. Um, So I may have gone too crazy, but uh, I looked at a lot of different items that we can use for the birds this year, and I think we have it covered. This is the fun that we're going to be starting out the nesting season, so I've been doing a lot of research to try to figure out some new items that we can use for nesting materials. The nesting materials we order are items you would find out in their natural environment, and they're not as specific. So we'll take this down the houses, we'll put it in their respective containers. And if we need more, we'll get more. And we probably will have more nesting birds this year. Hope so. Hope so. Hey, excuse us, we have a big box full of nesting material. Thank you. Last year, this was a little gem and fireweeds nest box. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go to the same one, but we're going to offer that up. If we would like to peek on them to see if they're doing all right, we just have a little handle to look in, give them their privacy. Then we also have another little window to look into their nest. This nesting box has a camera that has the infrared light, so we can view them without even having to open anything up. I'm like so excited. I've been looking forward to this since I started working with you birds. It's been really cool to see them kind of go from that mid-winter plumage to the beautiful colors we have now. And now I just see them in the next stage of their annual behavior. All right, guys. Oh, I see some interest. What do you guys think? Isn't this exciting stuff? We just have a <laughs> see, it's innate for these guys to see that nesting material and immediately show interest in carrying it around. And there we go. Grief just went right into her burrow. And Clyde is a man on a mission. He is so ready to build that nest. And he'll probably start making his way on up to his penthouse up here uh, to his nesting box in a minute. There goes Bonnie and he'll follow suit. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're just so happy. All right, guys, good luck. Make some beautiful nests, okay? Okay, and we're going to take that as well. All right, Lindsay, what did you think? So, uh, just after midnight, looks like a new way tonight. I'll get the egg out, we'll weigh it, then we give them some fish while we take the egg. Ooh. Okay, Lindsay, I'll have you stay to the left. Okay. All righty, we'll give a little bit of a knock just not to scare them that we're coming in. Hello? Anybody home? Hello, Lindsay. I know. So, I'm going to go ahead and grab the egg. All right. Yep. 
going to cover the egg with my hand. So in case the parent doesn't really enjoy that part, the egg looks really great and it's solid. There's no cracks. I feel very good about the way it looks right now. 99.8 pounds. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and put it right underneath. We're going to back in. Okay, I just usually keep on cover the egg to make sure that nice safe transition. So I'm going to let you go ahead and feed one. Yep, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and. This is so much more than I did before. Like all of the different types of nesting materials that we selected are in there. It's really overwhelming to finally see all of it come together. So it's it's really cool. All right. Well, how do you look at Wait. Add to them. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I just thought that was a really cool video that kind of showed um, how much these tufted puffins really do like need that nesting material to be able to have like a successful breeding season and enjoy their burrows and how quick they took to it. I thought that was really neat. Um, yeah, but kind of getting back into the second chapter of our research. So um, just talking about some of these drivers of habitat degradation. Um, so plant cover dynamics can be affected by so many things like climate conditions, strong winds, heavy rainfalls, the altitude, soil properties, oceanic flows, the geologic area of islands, um, isolation, and also human activity. Um, and seabirds themselves can also change the vegetation cover and richness through their guano, which is very nutrient rich and can change the makeup of the soil. Um, and so the main problem here in chapter two is that there's still uncertainty regarding which abiotic factors have led to this habitat degradation. And so managers are still unsure about which habitat restoration actions might be most effective. Um, so, for example, implementing artificial burrows or artificial wind shelter might be a very different management action than uh, removing invasive plant species, planting native grasses and shrubs, um, or removing invasive mammals, kind of depending on which, which things are causing this. Um, so in chapter two, our objectives are to assess whether site-specific, climatic, and environmental variables predict the magnitude of vegetation loss, um, and then assess the accuracy of those analyses using standard cross-validation error estimation. Um, and we hypothesized that the magnitude of vegetation loss at these breeding colonies would vary based on the mean summer air temperature, the mean summer precipitation, and wind flow characteristics at these islands. Um, and so within these tufted puffin models, the response variable that we're going to be looking at is the percent of vegetation change. And the predictor variables can kind of be broken up into two major categories. So physical site-specific characteristics and climate characteristics. Um, so for physical site-specific characteristics, we're going to be looking at um, factors such as human disturbance, proximity to the mainland, proximity to the nearest active colony, island size, vegetation cover, um, elevation aspect and slope. And then for climate characteristics, we're going to be looking at sea surface temperature, air temperature, precipitation, different airflow characteristics and winter storms. Um, and then also some basin scale climate indices that have fluctuated over this time period, such as the Pacific Ductal Oscillation um, or like El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, and just to reiterate some of our expected outcomes and significance, uh, we plan to quantify habitat change over the past few decades and then identify potential drivers of that habitat change. And we're really hoping that this can guide refuge managers in their habitat restoration actions on these islands um, and make comparisons with ecologically similar seabirds that also use Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge for breeding. Um, those 1.3 million other nesting seabird species um, or different seabirds of different species um, also use this habitat. And we think that a lot of research could build off of that um, and kind of use this as a springboard. Um, we also hope to make these data sets available for future analyses so people can continue to build off of these results. Um, and we're really thankful that this uh, collaboration 
This project facilitated collaboration between Oregon State University, ODFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, nonprofits, and then also the Confederated Tribes of the Kuskur, Umpqua, and Siusla Indians. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to quickly talk about a little outreach and communication project that I'm working on. Um, so I'm currently writing and illustrating a children's book about tufted puffins um, to kind of communicate the science to the more general public and get people really engaged and excited about coastal ecosystem conservation. Um, so our story is going to follow Penny the Puffin here, um, and she's going to start off on the Oregon coast um, at her island home, which her mother was born at and her great grandmother um, and many generations before her. But Penny's not going to be able to build her nest there when she wants to have a family because the, the world is changing and what used to be a very abundant sea full of fish um, is now kind of sparse. There's not enough vegetation for her to build her nest. So she's going to embark on a journey across the Pacific Northwest in home of this or in search of this perfect home. Um, and so she's going to travel throughout uh, all the different islands on the coast of Oregon, and she might go to some and find that it's too hot for a puffin like her, or she might go to another island and see that it's overrun with invasive mammals such as raccoons or weasels or rats, um, and move along to the next island where there might be too much pollution from humans, um, and she can't set up shop there either. And so it'll kind of be like a Goldilocks story in that way where she is looking for her perfect home and children will be able to learn about the different characteristics that tufted puppets need and kind of how to care for that habitat. Um, and we're also hoping to use this story to highlight a lot of the other really cool species on the Oregon coast um, that are, you know, easy to see from Newport and things like that, like the stellar sea lion. So she's going to encounter all these different species of um, wildlife on her journey and they're going to kind of guide her to their different homes, um, and she's going to figure out that it's not right for her. Um, but then she's going to meet another tufted puffin um, take her, take, that takes her back to his colony, and it's going to be all the things she hoped for, lots of vegetation, lots of fish, not too many people, no invasive plants and animals. Um, and then she'll finally have a little puffin baby of her own. Um, so we're really excited about this project, and. Uh, recently got a grant from the Oregon Wildlife Society um, to uh, print some books and send it off to local schools and coastal communities. Um, so we're hoping that this will be done in the next uh, few months or so. Um, and before I wrap up, I just wanted to quickly highlight some of the best places to see tufted puffin in Oregon now that um, breeding season is upon us. Um, typically, June is a really good time to go out and see them. So we're gearing up and getting ready for that breeding season. Um, our biggest colony on the Oregon coast is Haystack Rock at Cannon Beach, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, Three Arch Rocks National Wildlife Refuge also has the second largest breeding colony in Oregon. Um, and then if you're a little bit further south um, in Bandon, Base Rock, Goat Island, and uh, the Whale's Head Islands are also really great places to see tufted puffin. Um, and with that, I would just like to say thank you to all the many wonderful people who helped to make this project possible. Lots of mentors, people who provided um, funding and field help. Um, so yeah, just thank you to a lot of different people. Um, and last but not least, thank you all so much for being here and for your attention. Um, it was really great to visit with you all, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you. Sir. Were you able to, to uh, measure change in a bit of species on these islands? In uh -huh. Yeah. Just um, repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was, uh, were we able to measure change on any of the uh, vegetative species on these islands? Um, and the answer is no. <laughs> um, unfortunately, a lot of the imagery that I'm using was taken, you know, back in the 70s um, on a film camera. Um, so the re resolution is actually quite coarse. 
Um, so even though we have some high resolution imagery today, we're not able to go back 40 years and say this is what it once was. Um, but yeah, I'm, I was telling some folks earlier that I'm hoping to turn this into a PhD project. Um, and that would be something that we would highly consider is building models and talking to a lot of these coastal vegetation experts to kind of set that baseline for what the vegetation dynamics used to be. Um, so definitely some options out there, but thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, um, that's a good question. I can't say off the top of my head um, exactly how many, but as I was scrolling through kind of all the data, um, it it felt to me that at least a third um, I kind of took out. We have the counts from, I think, 79, 88, 2008, and 2021 were the only four coastwide surveys. Um, and so going through all those data, at least like a third of the islands and headlands are um, not uh, hosting breeding birds. But even back in the day, some of them were only, uh, even if there were only two birds, they would still count that as a site. So, yeah. Oh, yes. Go ahead in front here. You mentioned towards the end of your presentation the loss of food fish or food source. And I didn't, don't recall seeing that as one of the variables <clears throat> that you were stressing for your. Uh, how significant do you feel the loss of food source? For example, smell was an obvious fish that I saw. Uh, how significant is a decline in, in that type of species? Okay, so the question is about, uh, it's for people on Zoom, the, the question is about uh, the foraging fish, and uh, that was not a major part of this presentation. It was mostly about vegetation. So the question is, can you tell us a little bit about the fish populations and how that is affecting birds? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think it's quite clear that a lot of the fish communities have changed over the past 40 years or so, like with climate and with um, the rise in sea surface temperatures, that has an effect on the forage fish. Um, and a lot of people are suggesting that that's why the Alaskan populations are a bit more stable. It's because it's like cooler temperatures and there's like more abundance of fish. But that was something that we intentionally left out of this project um, as important as a factor that I think that is. Um, the land managers at the Oregon Islands Refuge Complex were like, we can do something to manage their habitat. So if there's a lack of vegetation, we can plant vegetation or if the burrows are collapsing because of erosion, we can provide artificial burrows. But that was one thing that I was very interested in, but they were like, we simply can't control the amount of fish in the sea to the extent that we would like to, you know? Um, so that's that's one thing that I think is very important in their population, but that I haven't dived into a lot for this project, especially since I'm, I'm just here for two years. They kind of want me in and out. <laughs> Yes, and yeah. oh, someone wants to know when uh, we can get the book that uh, Karina is working on, children's book. Um, I don't know. How do I get my, I think, I don't know how to get this thing down here. Oh, ah. you mean to get rid of that? Uh-huh. Go over to the three dots here. Okay, and then select, uh, yeah, that's it. Hi. Okay, that's my email. So <laughs> um, shoot me an email and we're hoping maybe by like December, it's been a slow process. Um, so I'm just like painting it all by hand um, in between research and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, hopefully by December. So please reach out and I'd be more than happy to connect with you guys over that. Continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were acrylic paint and then I took them to like a scanner place that turned them into PDFs. <laughs> yeah. Here. Will any of your work be integrated into the uh, exhibit that they have at the Oregon Coastal Area? 
So the question is about will any of the work that Corrine is doing be part of the Oregon Coast Aquarium exhibits? Uh, not that I know of. <laughs> um, I would, I feel like it's still in the beginning stages, so I haven't really been like telling a lot of people about it, but I would definitely be open to working with um, the Oregon Coast Aquarium or even some of the displays they have with like the wildlife or the National Wildlife Refuge. I'd be super interested to kind of um, use it as like an outreach tool. I think that would be really cool if people would be into it. Oh, yes, sir. I got to the basic people, but uh, a, a television I saw video of small eagles trading in a rookery. Nothing really. Is that still a problem? The question is about bald eagles and whether they are a problem uh, with the tufted puffins as they are with the common myrrh. Go ahead. Yeah, totally. Um, that was one of the things that the refuge managers also brought up was predation. Uh, probably one of their main predators are bald eagles, um, kind of going in and taking like the young puffins as they're starting to emerge from the burrows. Um, and things like that. But that was another thing where they were like, well, we can't go, you know, trapping all the bald eagles. So <laughs> we're just going to have to, you know, count our losses on that one. But yeah, bald eagles are definitely a, a big threat to them. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions for here. Oh, one more. Question is, what drew Karina to? studying puffins uh yeah um throughout my kind of like undergraduate i was mainly interested not by like a specific species but just kind of like species of greatest conservation need um like the lizards i studied in my undergraduate were threatened and they were on a military base um so we were kind of testing their stress levels to see if the military the noisy aircraft um affected the lizard stress levels in any way um and we actually just published a paper that was really cool we found out that they the lizards are stress eaters in response to the noisy aircraft which is so crazy. Um, <laughs> but I was always kind of interested in humans' impact on wildlife um, and how we can conserve these species moving forward. And so I applied to this position um, that was very open. And my advisors were like, "We, you can work on any species as long as it's a species of greatest conservation need in Oregon. Um, and they pitched me a few project ideas. And one of them were like, uh, I think like mussels, and another one was like lichen, how's that now? <laughs> and then they they pitched me the puffin idea. And I was like, uh, okay, I'm gonna snatch it <laughs> where somebody else does. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Karina. So thank you again very much. Really appreciate you all coming out tonight. Thank you.